we're continuing on in the, in the book of Acts as we look at this uh, sermon series called Hurdles. Uh, so I'm preaching on Acts chapter 6 in line with what's been going on before, but also it's a grad sermon. So I'm having to do both, uh, preach the, the word, but also remember we're, we're talking about grads. And as I was writing this sermon, I started thinking about when I was in college, like when I graduated high school, and I realized there's something, I don't think I, I mean, I tell stories a lot to these group, but I don't think anyone has heard this, this secret before. Uh, so I want to open up to you and be very honest about a time in my life in college. Um, for two years, when I was at Ozark Christian College, I was a kindergarten small group leader. There it is. My head is the one that's sort of floating in the middle. For two years, now you may be like, why is that a big deal? I don't work with children. I don't know if you guys knew that. Like, I've been here a long time, and it's students all the way, baby. That's what I like to do. If I think about taking over Katie's position as a children's pastor, I just, I would need to take a nap. Just thinking about it. It's too much work. It's so hard. I, you know, people are geared for it, and people say that about me in student ministry, but uh, it is not what I would want to do. And yet, when I was in college, I spent two years working with kindergarten students. And so if, if student ministry is where I feel like God has called me, not children's ministry, then why on earth did I spend two years doing this? And I think that's a great question, even though I'm the one who asked it. And I promise that I will answer that question by the end of the sermon. But to get to that answer, what I want to do is walk through our passage today of Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. If you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and open up to there. There should be one around you. You can use your uh, device if you need to, but Acts chapter 7, or I'm sorry, Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. And what we're going to do today is look at what is the, what scripture has to say about serving in the church. Like I said, um, to give you a little bit of background, we're, we're going through this series called Hurdles because we're looking at the early church and some of the hurdles that they faced. And when you look at Acts chapter 5 and now 6 and next week 7, you're going to see some of the biggest hurdles that, that Christians still face to this day. In Acts chapter 5, we looked at this idea of materialism with Ananias and Sapphira and how we still see that today that one of the first problems that started to creep up in the early church was the desire for stuff. And what do you know, it's still around. And then next week, we're going to begin looking at Stephen, and I don't want to give any spoilers, but uh, he's the first person to be persecuted for his faith. And the, the hurdle is not so much, at least from my perspective, that he was persecuted, although that's going to happen in the church. But the idea is that he was willing to suffer. And so one of the hurdles that we face as Christians is this idea of like, uh, am I willing to as a Christian, am I willing to have things not go my way because of my faith? Could I still hold on to my faith if I'm not getting what I want, even to the point of suffering? So we'll be looking at that later on. But today, the hurdle that we see in the church, that the church is facing in Acts chapter 6, is the challenge of internal division. Not as flashy as like persecution, but I would argue that it's one of the more devastating things that's been going on within the church and that separates and breaks up the church, which is internal division. Acts chapter 6 in the book of Luke is the shortest chapter in the entire book. And it answers a big question, which is, how do you deal with people who are not like you? And when you look at the context, one interesting thing is, who wrote this? And it's Luke. Luke wrote Acts. Luke wrote Luke and also Acts. And a fun fact about Luke is this. Luke's not Jewish. As a matter of fact, he's a Gentile, which is not Jewish. And he is the only Gentile writer in the entire New Testament. And he's the one who's writing about, how do you deal with people who are not like you? And I imagine to him this would be personal or encouraging as he sees what the early church is doing. How do you deal with people who are not like you? This will be a point that Luke focuses on in chapter 6 here and in 7 and in 8 and in 9 and in 10 and in 11. Sometimes when we look at the church and people who are not like us, let's just be honest, from its inception, the church has dealt with prejudice. 
And you may not be prejudiced against anyone's skin color, but if we're being honest, we all have prejudice, even today, even in the church. It might not be, like I said, prejudice against the skin color or something that's ours, but it could just be your prejudice against some uh, uneducated people. Or maybe your prejudice against those who have a different culture than you, or someone who has a different uh, economic level than you, either lower than you or higher than you. Maybe you're prejudiced against those who vote for a different political party, but all of us make assumptions about other people that aren't necessarily true. And the thing about it is, it, it doesn't begin with the person that's like way different than me. It actually starts with the person that's only slightly different than me. Like in this room, we're all here to worship Jesus, but when I look around, I start seeing the differences in this room. That's different for me. I see older people, younger people, wealthier people, right? I see people from different backgrounds, people I don't know. So I'm just making up, what do I think? And it's not that it's malicious, but we just do this naturally where we kind of fill in the blanks. And sometimes that can guide us into ways that we shouldn't be going. And we see these divisions pop up. And so, we're going to see that in chapter 6, as the church began to grow, it started to have internal division. But, once again, the leadership of the apostles, led by the Holy Spirit, they addressed these issues, and they continued to grow. So, I don't know if any graduates are still here. A lot of them were here for first service. They may have left after this. I was like, I just need you here for the beginning. So, a a few times throughout this thing, I'm going to be like, so graduates, and as I look around, I'll just say this, students, because some of you are going to be graduating. Some of you are in college uh, and your college age, and it's all the same. Because to this age group, I want to say, I want to offer you three lessons that we can learn when it comes to serving in the church. So we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 6, and I'm going to go through all seven verses, one through seven. Verse 1, in those days... When the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word, to, to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and also Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. It begins with, in those days, and as a side note, I have nothing interesting to say about this other than we don't know what that means. Uh, When it comes to the church starting in Acts chapter 2, how far has it been? How long has it been? We don't know. This could have been a number of months or even years until we get to Acts chapter 6. How long has the church been growing? We're not quite sure. But before we really get into the rest of it, we need to define some things. I'm I'm very sensitive to when I see a word I don't know because I think, as I'm working with students, they don't know and they're not going to ask, right? And maybe you've grown up being like, look, I kind of get the gist. There's different groups of Jews here. I don't know, whatever. And so the two words that stand out to me are the Hellenistic Jews and the Hebraic Jews. what's, What's the big deal about these two groups? Okay, number one, they're both Jewish. They're both Jewish. They both have grown up Jewish following the Old Testament laws. However, the Hebrew Jews, the Hebrew widows, the Hebraic widows speak Aramaic, and that was the language that was spoken in Israel around Jerusalem at the time. They grew up in this area. They speak Aramaic, the common language of the day, but the Hellenistic Jews spoke Greek. You know why? Because they're not from Israel. Hellenistic Jews have been raised around Israel in other countries, and they have merged their Jewish faith with Greek traditions because it was popular at the time. And so they're still worshiping the same God, but they have a different background. 
that they bring to the table. And what ends up happening is, is that Jews who lived outside of Israel as they got older would come back to Israel, to their motherland, so that when they die, they would be buried on sacred soil. Uh, many times when the, uh, a woman's husband passed, she'd be like, well, time to go. Like, I need to make this journey so that if anything happens to me, at least I'm in Israel. And so you have an influx of Hebraic widows there. And also, women just live longer. And so you would have more widows. Now, the Hellenistic Jews speak Greek. That's not the common language in Israel. And they also probably dressed differently because they have a different culture. They for sure cooked differently, and I don't mean that they were cooking things that were unclean, but look, we focus on the weirdest things that are slightly different. Like, go to someone else's church. Have you ever done that? If you've gone to someone else's church and they do communion, and you think to yourself, ooh, I like this bread, you know, and you, you notice even like, oh, this is, they're using real glass for their communion cups. We just have plastic. And just little things stand out to us. Not good, not bad, not right or wrong. Just like if it's different, it stands out because that's not what I'm used to, good or bad. And so you have them cooking these meals that are not unclean, but also not the way the true Jews from Israel cook their food. And that was kind of a point of contention. Also, they have different cultural habits. When I was uh, at Ozark, I was an RA. I, uh, I had to try out for it a few years and then finally got it. And then when I became RA, that's the resident assistant, your head of the entire floor, I thought I was hot stuff. And we had these resident directors, this older couple. We called them Mom and Dad Hollingsworth. Uh, they were in their, I think they were in their 60s at the time. And bless them, they, they lived in the dorms. There's an apartment that was built into the dorm and they just... It's just there's so many of us. Anyway, so they would have these meetings once a week with all the RAs, and I go in, like my first meeting, I'm feeling pretty confident, like, yeah, that's right, excuse me, boys, I'm going to go with the adults now and plan whatever they do. And as soon as I walk in, she goes, could you please take off your hat? And I was like, what? Uh, okay. And I quickly found out from Mom Hollingsworth that she was not messing around when it came to hats inside the apartment. You take that off when you come into her house. And what I realized is that her culture, from many years earlier, men would wear hats a lot more than we do now, like fedoras. And, and it was so much a part of their culture that it was an extension of who they were. You would tip your hat to a lady. You would take your hat off and cover your heart for the Pledge of Allegiance. And you would take it off when you walk inside someone's house out of a sign of respect. Now, I had not showered for three days. So I needed it to cover my greasy hair as I walked into her house. Uh, my culture was a little different than what she was raised with. I had none of these expectations or cultural norms for hat wearing, right? Not right or wrong. It's just for the way we were raised. And so you have these two groups coming together that are from different backgrounds. These Hellenistic Jews didn't fit in well with the Hebrew Jews. And now they all believe in Christ. And now they're not going to different synagogues, but they're actually worshiping at the same home church. So why were they overlooked? They're both widows. To be honest, we don't know. There's a couple of different theories. Um, one was maybe it's because they weren't speaking up for themselves when they would say, who needs food? And because, the cult, because they were struggling to know, you know, if you're not sure what to do, you don't speak out, especially if it's another language, or you just nod your head because you're not sure. And so it's a theory, who knows? But even if the theory is the disciples or the apostles dropped the ball, I think that's fair. I think it's fair because when the church starts in Acts chapter 2, we have 12 disciples leading the church. And what have we seen? Thousands came, and thousands came, and thousands came, and more thousands come. And let's see, how many more do we have leading the church? Still 12. Still just 12 guys leading now thousands of people. Except now they're preaching and teaching and praying, and they're handling money. In Acts chapter 5, we know about that. They're dividing up resources, and in this case, they're also overseeing food distribution. They have a lot on their plates as thousands of people are coming, and they're trying to handle it. So these widows go home hungry, <laughs> and if that weren't bad enough, they see other widows totally eating, and they make the, the, they make the connection. What's different from us to them? Oh, 
they're also Hebrew Jews along with the apostles from Israel. Well, of course, I see the connection here. And so what do they assume? Because prejudice does go both ways. They assume because they're Hellenistic Jews and not Hebrew that they're being overlooked on purpose. So the issue is brought before the apostles. In James chapter 1, verse 27, it says, Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Pure religion, it requires that we step up when others can't. There are needs all around us. I just want you to think about that for a second. There are needs all around us, both in this room and also in your life, people who have needs. And because of your proximity to some of these needs, God may place that issue on your heart and make it personal for you. If you've ever thought the phrase, someone should do something about that, I think, I think the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, and not to say, well, now you're in charge of all of it, but at the same time, when we worry about God calling us to like Africa to be a missionary, it doesn't work like you're going kicking and screaming. It starts off with something like, Someone needs to go tell them. It starts off with that, that kernel of desire of like, who's going to, this almost outrage, who's going to do something about this? And he, God can begin to use you and others like you who, have, who feel just as passionate to make a difference in the lives of others. And so there are times when you see needs and you're like, oh, I... I want to do something, or you realize maybe you do need to do something about it. But let's be honest, some of you may be thinking, I don't know of any needs. I mean, sure, some people are struggling a little bit, but it's not, I don't feel convicted to do that. And so, what do you do if you don't see the needs? So, I'm, I'm speaking a lot to the graduates or to the college students or the high schoolers, but as you go off on your own, how are you supposed to serve if you don't know people? You're brand new to an area. What do you do? A lot of my answers are going to be the church. Just ask the church. If someone were to come to Wallula and say, is there anywhere in, in the church or outside of the church I could serve? Oh, my word. We have so many answers for you. We could even tell you what kind you want to do. Do you want to serve on Sunday mornings or do you want to serve throughout the week? Would you like to serve relationally face-to-face? -face? And if, you're, if that's a little weird for you, then we, can, we have ways that you could serve behind the scenes and set up and, and things where you're not up on stage or leading worship or teaching a class. We have a lot of different ways you can serve. If you, if you want to know, like, well, are there organizations in the community that are making a difference in the lives of others? Guess what? Yes, there are, and we know them. We know them personally. We can get you plugged into those organizations so that you can help meet the needs of the people in this area. There are a lot of places to serve, but it requires you to first see the need. If God hasn't laid it on your heart yet, it doesn't mean you're exempt. Graduates, you will continually be surrounded by the needs in your life. So whether you go away or stay home for this next stage of your life, pay attention to the leading of the Holy Spirit and seek the resources from the local church about what you could do to make a difference for his kingdom. Lesson number two is serve the church. It's fine if you want to see the need, and if you see it, and you can name it, and you can call it out, and the injustice, and whatever, and then if you just say, well, my work here is done, and you walk away, that's not exactly what God is calling you to do. The step number two is serve the church. In verse two, it says, so the twelve gathered all the disciples together. It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait tables, they said. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom, and we will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the Word. And this proposal pleased the whole group. So they chose Stephen and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and, and Parmenas and Nicholas. And they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. Now, there's a phrase in here that is a little weird. <laughs> It would not be right for us to neglect our ministry just to wait on tables. And it's like, sometimes I think if, if we're hearing it in English, we may be like, oh, that was a little, a little rude. Oh, I'm sorry, apostles, that it was beneath you to do that. And we can sometimes infer our own 
prejudice or judgment on the way people are saying things. But here's the deal. Nothing is below the the apostle serving. There's no toilet too dirty to be cleaned and no trash too dirty to be emptied for the apostles. They are willing to do anything. Even from the teachings of Jesus, Mark 10, 45, it says, Jesus said, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. He washed their feet at their protest to say, this is what you need to do. So they're willing to do anything. However, here's the problem. There's only certain things, there's only so many things that they can do that no one else can. So like a lot of people could change diapers, but not a lot of people could lead this growing church. And specifically for these 12, Jesus didn't call everyone when he said, you were Peter and on this rock I will build my church. (laughs) He called Peter to lead that church. And so it's not that it's beneath them, but they feel the call of their life right now is to, since they were with Jesus, to continue to teach his message, preach his message, to continue to pray as Jesus did, to continue to lead with faithfulness. Only they can do that at this time. So, they assign seven men to lead this group to help the widows. And here is what's interesting. This is like, I feel nerdy being like, oh, this is so cool, this is crazy, but here we go. If you read the list of five names, or the, in verse five, that list of names, just names, right? Fun fact, every single name in that list is Greek. Every name is Greek. Every name is Hellenistic. They were on the Hellenistic widow's side of this debate, and the apostles and their leadership said, we're going to pick seven people from this one side to lead the widows. So not only were these men able to understand their specific culture and speak their specific language of these neglected widows, but, and here's the other thing, the apostles went out of their way to choose seven Greek-speaking people, maybe first or second generation, to lead the group. It's not, that, it's not just that the widows weren't getting fed, and so they're like, oh, my bad, here's some food. Do you remember how they worded it? Why have you forgotten them? There's an accusation there. They're taking it personal. You're doing this on purpose. And so they're extending an olive branch and showing like, hey, it is not the Hebrews versus Hellenistic Jews here. Like, we are following Christ, and uh, even if it's for, even if our side feels slighted by this maneuver of putting seven Greek leaders in the church to, to lead over this, that's so be it. We want you to know that we love you, and we're not trying to play us versus them. And so we will make this, this next group of leaders in the church the, from the minority group, we will make them the leaders and not try to keep it balanced and fair in Hebrew and Hebraic, or Hellenistic and, and, and Hebrew, all seven, Greek background. Because the big picture is this, more than a party line, more than their cultural differences, the unity of this church was above all. The unity of the church. Okay, that's fine. Zach, are we talking about unity today? I thought we were talking about service. Okay, like it's, it's a good story, and you're, oh, they're very unified, and that's, that was good, so the church didn't break up, but why are we talking about this? It's because they're both connected. One of the quickest ways for the church to become splintered and divided is for people to feel overlooked and dismissed. Have you ever been in a church split before? Have you ever been around people who, where you feel like your viewpoint doesn't matter or is looked down upon? That even if you disagree, you can't disagree well? It's just, it's stifling. You don't want to be there. You get easily agitated with anything that they may say, and it just continues to splinter the group, whether it's your family or a church. And one of the best ways to combat that division is for a community to serve one another. It reminds me of Acts 4. At the beginning, when it said, all believers were of one heart and one mind, and no one claimed that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. It is hard to feel divided when you're playing for the same team. I, 
I used to struggle when it came to grad Sundays. Like Lance said, this is your passage because you're preaching through Acts. But most of the time, it's like, grad Sunday, it's all you, Zach. Go get them, you know? And so I'm like, okay, what do I want the grads to know this year? What do I want to focus on? And and so you're like, this may be the last time I see a lot of them for a while. Is this going to sink? Are they going to remember any of this stuff? And, And it's like, should I say focus on your quiet time and prayer life and personal growth? Should I say focus on, you know, whatever else? And it's all good. But year after year, after watching students go off to college or just go off on their own, one of the biggest factors that I've noticed between those who grow in their faith and those who don't is finding a local church. Those who intentionally not just go to church but get plugged in. I don't mean just go to church on Sundays. Look, I'll be honest, if you're in high school or even in college right now, um, if you go to church consistently, that's a big deal with your friend group. Because most people don't do that your age. Most people don't do that anyway, statistically. But, but especially a college student, a young adult, you go to church every week, whoa, man, you're like really spiritual. And it makes you feel like, well, I'm doing pretty good here. And I want to just be the first to say that that's the bare minimum. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad you're going to church, and and you should be, and I want you to, but if you're like, man, I'm killing it here because I show up once a week on Sundays, God did not save you to go to church on Sundays. That was not his mission for your life. In Ephesians 2, it says, we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Not created in Christ Jesus to go to church on Sundays. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We're created in Christ Jesus to work. And not just any work, but good work. Work that makes a difference. Work that has a purpose. Work that goes just beyond you. Work that serves others. Work that makes a difference in the kingdom of God. You're living out your faith when you do good works. I've said this stat before, but it's still true. 60 to 70 percent of graduates, and I am lowballing it here. 60 70 percent of graduates who grow up in the church will stop going to church on their own after three weeks when they're on their own. Get plugged in to the local church and serve. It's the best way that you can help your own faith grow and make connect to a community that's bigger than your own. Lesson number three is stay focused on the mission. Stay focused on the mission. Verse 7 said, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. The word of God spread, and the church grew. There's a picture I want to show. It's of our uh, board of ministries that we have. We call it BOM, Board of Ministries, but it's basically just the ministry leaders, those who, not just those who work at the church, but those who volunteer and are, are, are um, big volunteers who, who help out a lot. And so we have a, a group picture. This is probably from like two weeks ago. We have this picture because Dave Coleman is leaving in a couple of weeks. So shout out. If you have a bulletin, you can check that out. We have a, I believe it's June 2nd. We're doing a little thing for him. Um, but he's like, hey, I'm going to be gone. I would like a group picture. And so this was the group picture, and I love it. I I love seeing all the people uh, that work and serve behind the scenes here at Wallula. An interesting thing about these Board of Ministries meetings is that when Lance first came on, he created this mission statement for Wallula, and one of the things he would do at the Board of Ministries meeting is he would always have, like, notes for us to take paper that we could take notes on, and he would say, before we start, I want you to write the mission statement for Wallula from memory. Let's see who knows it. And I was like, oh, oh, no. I mean, students, you know, I was like, I didn't want to test on this. I just came to, so I'm like, okay, I think, you know, and so I remember saying it. And, and after years of doing this, Walula Christian Church exists to glorify God through equipping believers and transforming the casual. All right, I got it. <laughs> I wrote it down, but I didn't think I was going to need it. Thankfully, Lance had us do that all the time. But there's a phrase in that that always stood out to me. 
exists to glorify God through equipping believers and transforming the casual. It's just a weird phrase. It's, it's, it's not a bad phrase, and I understand what it means, but you don't, you don't hear it spoken like that. And then transform the casual. And so, I want to let you know, graduates, students, Walula, but especially those who are like beginning their faith journey on their own. When you look, when I look around at when I was in youth group and in college and here at Walula, I have, I have seen so many lives transformed for Jesus. I mean, th- people that I was like, there's no way they would ever believe. And just casual people who are casual about their faith or about religion and who came to know Jesus and man, their lives have changed. But I also want to let you know that I've seen many of those transformations fade. I want to let you know right now my experience, and it will, I would be shocked if it wasn't yours as well, that you will have friends and leaders that you look up to because of their faith that barely go to church anymore and will walk away altogether. You will have people in your life that you care about and even look up to that were transformed that will not be anymore. The early church had the same focus and the same mission, making Jesus known. And in doing so, they, brought, they had disciples, people got saved. Everyone in the church had the same mission, and because of that, the church grew. But when we let our guard down, when when we let the things of this world distract us from putting Jesus first, we're going to lose. Even in this story, it sometimes, it kind of rubs me the wrong way. Like, you know, it's not in my language. It's It's a summary. But like, the disciples, let's say they make a mistake. Hey, sorry about that. And they're like, why did you guys do this to these women? Like, there's an, there's an accusatory tone a little bit. Why are you favoring this group over the other? Now, look, Let's say it's me. I'd be like, whoa, whoa, easy. First off, put your finger down. I don't like you pointing at me, right? You can get that feel that they're, they're coming at. And it's like, secondly, uh, let's have some respect for the position here, right? I didn't do this on purpose. It was an accident. My bad. We'll take care of it, right? You, you can, even when both sides are wanting to make it better, sometimes our pride can get in the way to cause division, in the way we interact, in the way we accuse, in the way we take constructive criticism, even if it's good and right and true. But what's so fascinating about the story is you don't see any finger pointing in this. They said, hey, these women are, why is there favoritism being shown? Or, you know, like, they're not, what, what's going on here? And they're advocating for these widows, and the disciples are like, you're right. We need to do better. We need to focus on this, and we need someone else to take this over because it's too big for us. What should we do? Let's have a plan. And they come up with a plan, and they execute it, and the church grew because it wasn't about them, but it was about Jesus. It wasn't about their pride or their egos. It was about loving others and ministering to others in need. In Hebrews 12, it says, Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Graduates, when you think about your, the next stage of your life and what are you going to do for the rest of your life, understand that over and over again in Scripture, it's talked about as a marathon. And not to get nerdy, but I'm about to. If, you're, if you live to be 80 and you're about 20 now, you're a fourth of the way done with this marathon. you still got like 18 miles to go, which is a long way. And people are going to fall out of this race. It's not about hurrying up. It's not about being ahead of someone at mile six. It's about not stopping. Fix your eyes on Jesus so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Some of my closest friends who don't even believe in Jesus anymore, it wasn't because they had some intellectual angst and whatever, whatever. They just stopped going to church as much. And then they stopped going Even like the time between was going further and further. And then they just really weren't going to church, but they believed in Jesus. They were just like, you know, life, whatever. I just don't go to church. Um, I don't really like the churches in my area, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay. 
And then three or four years later, having the conversation of them saying, I didn't know how to tell you this, but I don't believe anymore. And it wasn't because of anything specific. It was just living a lifestyle that wasn't focused on Jesus. And remember what Hebrew says? Focus on Jesus so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. If you take your eyes off him, it's not that Satan's just going to come and, and snap, snap you up. But man, it just, you start to wear down, start to question things. Do we really need to go to church? Do we really need to serve others? Do we really need to think about Jesus? Nah, eh, you just kind of lose heart. Students, as you go off on your own, just, just so you know, fun fact, in life and in ministry, uh, you are more likely to not give up if you have someone running with you. Don't do this alone. Get plugged into a local church. Join in what other believers are doing who are focused on the same mission as you. I want to go real quick back to the, uh, as we wrap this up, back to the original question I had. Why on earth did I serve in the children's ministry? And I have an amazing answer. Are you ready? Because the children's pastor asked. All that build up for such a not great answer, but it's true. The children's pastor asked. He asked a group of us, hey, would you guys be willing to serve on Wednesday nights? And I said, for like what, like a month? And he says, Wednesdays. I said, <laughs> for what? And he goes, for the school year. And I thought, oh, well, sweet. This is an easy answer. No, I'm not going to give up my, what? No, I'm not giving up Wednesdays. And I realized I'm not doing anything. I got Wednesdays open, but I'm not like, that's just a lot. That's a big commitment. And I had never made that commitment. My parents may have made me go to youth group. But now it's on me, and I'm like, ah, do I really want to give up a whole year? But God really convicted me, because it's like, okay, fine, don't do this. What are you going to do instead, Zach? And I was like, well, I mean, no one's approached me to help with anything else. So, so it convicted me, because I knew there was really a need. There was a lot of students, and also, he said, you know, and also having male leaders, man, we just don't have many of those in the kids' ministry. It would really be a, a really cool thing if you could do this. And so... Uh, I knew I should be serving, so I said yes, and I'm going to, no lie, it was great. I loved it. I loved it so much that they're like, would you be interested in doing it again, and, and they said, we'll give you the same class, and so I got to move up, so I did first grade the next year, and I had the same class, and it was so fun. I also realized I don't want to do student ministry, or I don't want to do children's ministry, and that's okay. This isn't going to be forever. I just wanted to do it for, I did it for two years and enjoyed it a lot. But even though I tried something and failed, where I realized I'm not going to do this for the rest of my life, when I failed, what I learned was I should be serving. I, I don't know doing what. I don't know where God wants me. I know it's not here. I mean, this is great, but I want to see what else there is. And so because of that, every time I was at another church, I would just ask, is there, what, who needs help with what? So I was on a greeting team one time. Uh, There's another church out in D.C. where I was an intern, and I had my Sunday mornings open, and so I was part of the setup crew because they needed help with that. So I would get there too early in the morning, like 6 or 6.30, to help set up. And then when I came to Wallula, wasn't planning on staying in Lansing, but I was going to be here for nine months, and so I told my youth pastor, Mark Palmer, hey, do you need any help? I'm here anyway. And I had this habit of just always pitching in where I could because I wanted to serve in the church. And so Mark Palmer said, yeah, and then he decides it's time to leave after like six years. There's another picture they're going to post up here. After me serving for two months helping out, Mark's like, I'm out. And, uh, and everyone's like, are you going to stay? And I was like, no, I'm not, but I'll help until May. And so this is the last picture that our former youth pastor, my youth pastor, Mark Palmer, took with the, with the student ministry. I'm way up in the corner in the white shirt uh, fun fact, in the middle with the black shirt is Katie Baker, our children's pastor. She was a freshman when I started. And Mark's in the back with the other hat. That was the last time he was here, and I was just here to help. I said I could do this for one semester, and then I'm gone. And that was 2005. <laughs> it's been a long semester. I didn't think I was going to be here. But what happened was I just kept wanting to serve the church, and God kept revealing no to this, but also what about this? Graduates and Wallula, please hear me when I say this. Serving is essential for your spiritual growth. And it's also essential for the growth of the church. We are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And so whether you are moving away 
or whether you're staying here, find a place where your time and your talents and your abilities can be used to benefit his kingdom. And through that journey, let God mold you into becoming more and more like Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have before you. Lord, we're thankful for the graduates and and recognizing even our own place of where we were when we graduated and realizing uh, just that snapshot in history in our own lives and and how special it is for them. Uh, But on top of all that, there's still uncertainty. Um, Being late teens and early 20s, uh, what are you going to do? We need some answers. What about this? What about that? Is this really what I want to do? And there's a lot of uncertainty. So Lord, I pray that even though this is normal for so many people, that you would guide these students. I don't know what they're supposed to do, but I do do know they're supposed to be like Christ. I pray that you would help our students and this congregation find ways that we can serve our neighbors, serve the church, serve the community. Lord, we take our example from you, who loved us enough to lay down his life for us. And so, Lord, we pray that we can use our lives to serve you. We love you so much and we thank you for Jesus.